I'd like to welcome all of you back to the Road to Reconciliation, where we're taking a walk through the idea of atonement and how the Lord's sacrifice on Calvary has affected us in so many ways and how it works for us. How does Jesus save us? Today we're going to be talking about the covering. And as we open the Word today, we're going to find out that Jesus is our covering, if we didn't know that already. But we're going to find out how that works according to Scripture. So before we open God's Word together, I'm going to invite you to bow your heads wherever you are as I kneel and ask the Lord to be with us. Father in heaven, I just want to thank you so much that we have such an opportunity to study the beautiful plan of salvation. Lord, you've given everything that heaven could afford for us. And we pray, Lord, that as we search into the scriptures and find the beauty and the expense of lifting us up from our sinful state to becoming part of the family of God once again, I, I pray that we would have a sense of the awesome beauty and the awesome love that it took for you to bring us back home. And so, Lord, as we open your word today, we pray for your Holy Spirit to be with us. Where two or more are gathered, you say, there you will be in their midst. And so we, we thank you for the fulfillment of your promise. And we pray that your spirit would move upon us, Lord, that we might understand and know those things that are meaningful to us in our walk with you, that we would have a clearer, closer picture of Jesus after having spent this time together. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. So today we're going to be beginning to talk about the covering. And I'm going to start again where we left off, or where we started actually, in our first session. We're going to start at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. There the Bible says, To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. We understand that Jesus was reconciling the world. And yesterday we went through all of those doctrinal statements and, and ideas and models of the atonement to, to figure out what and where some of those ideas fit into the plan of salvation. And, and we realized that many of them had errors. They didn't cover the entire aspect. And so we're looking at Scripture to see a little bit deeper, a little bit broader, the entire aspect of atonement and reconciliation as pointed out for us in the scriptures. So and this is kind of our verse that we've been going with. And so we're going to look at this idea of reconciling the world. Christ is bringing us back into one. And part of that word atonement and reconciliation, especially when we looked in the Old Testament, that word kafar in Hebrew, talked about a covering. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the covering that Christ provides for us today. We all need coverage of some sort. In our daily lives, we need coverage. Matter of fact, where I live in the United States, we need coverage for just about anything. Insurance for everything, from our cars to our homes to our, our families to you name it, we probably are supposed to have coverage for it somewhere. But some of us need coverage that can't be gotten at the local insurance salesman. Sometimes we have coverages for things that we need that, that are beyond the risk value for most companies. And so if you have something very high risk, you might have to go to a company like Lloyd's of London. Lloyd's is an insurance company whose their, their name to fame, you would say, is to insure high risk endeavors, high risk people, whether it be maritime and shipping insurance as, as they be, had their beginning. Matter of fact, Lloyd's of London was, was the company that was insuring the Titanic at the time. Uh, that it uh, met its demise. Lloyd's of London also insures satellites that orbit the Earth. Lloyd's of London insures stuntmen and daredevils and people in the military for their life insurance. Matter of fact, Lloyd's of London will cover all, cover all sorts of strange things, including body parts, if you want those things covered. But we need something more than that. We actually need coverage that Lloyd's of London can't provide. And so instead of going to Lloyd's of London for our coverage, we need to go to Jesus of Nazareth. We need to go to the Lamb of God, the Son of God, the one who came to, 
to die to take away the sins of the world. And what do we need covered? Well, when you think about your life, think back in the years past. I know I can. Think back and imagine things that I've done that I would really like covered. Not with insurance, but just covered. Covered over. Set away. So I don't have to dwell on them anymore. So I don't have to face the shame of what I did. I mean, maybe in your life you need something covered. Some words that were said that can never be taken back. A deed that was done that can't be undone. Actions and conducts of life that you really wish could just be covered over and forgotten. Friends, Jesus provides that kind of coverage. And we're going to look at what he provides for us today. We're going to open up and take a look at Psalm 51, verse 4, because when we are talking about coverage and coverage for sin, we have to remember who it is that we are addressing when we sin, who it is we sin against. Psalm chapter 51, verse 4, the Bible says, Against thee and thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, to be clear when thou judgest. It's against God and God alone that we sin and we offend. It's against Him that we sin. And in Genesis chapter 39, verse 9, it says, And there is none greater in this house is Joseph speaking as he's being faced by Potiphar's wife. And she says, look, he says, I, there's nobody greater in this house than I. Neither hath he, Potiphar, kept anything back from me but thee, because thou art his wife. Then how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Sometimes when we sin, we start thinking that, you know, oh, sin, I did something wrong and it hurt the people around me. Or I did a sin and it, and it hurt me. Or I did a sin and it caused some great financial catastrophe or whatever. And we kind of start having an idea that sin only affects the people around us. And sin is against the, the, the closest people around us or the things around us. But the fact of the matter is sin is sin against God. And this is where we have to start our basis for our coverage. Sin is against God, which is why God provided the coverage. In Romans 4, 6, and 7, it says, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are those, they, whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. God does not place upon you your sin. He places upon you the righteousness of Christ. Your sins are covered. That's a beautiful I think. The Lord has provided a covering in the process of reconciling the world unto himself, which is the ministry of, that Jesus came to do, to, the process of bringing us back together into the harmony of heaven. God says part of that is the imputation of righteousness to us and that our sins are covered. It's a beautiful thought, but when did this work of reconciling begin? When did it possibly begin? Maybe did it begin only when you and I searched for the covering? When we first started to look for a, a forgiveness for our sins? Or when did it begin? When does the Bible say it began? In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, the Bible says, For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. The Bible tells us that Christ was the lamb without blemish and without spot, whose blood was shed for us. He was foreordained to be that lamb before the foundation of this world. Indeed, the Bible even says in Revelation 13, 8, that all that dwell upon the earth, speaking of those who, of the wicked, shall worship him, talking of the beast, whose names are not written in the book of life, of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. From the very beginning of the world, Jesus is providing reconciliation for the human race. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, as we look back to that very first need, if you will, of reconciliation, that need when the covering had to begin as Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. 
And God, and, and, and they recognized what they had done. They looked up and they saw that they were naked. And Genesis 3, 7 says, The eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. They sewed these fig leaves together. They tried to cover themselves. They recognized their, that they were naked and they tried to cover themselves. Interesting, as they made these aprons, that literally means loin coverings. They tried to cover themselves because of their shame. You know, in our life, maybe in your life, this has happened to you. There are times when we've chosen to do something that was shameful, sinful, shameful. And we seek to try to hide our shame. Maybe we try to gloss over the fact that we did something wrong. Maybe we, we even kind of hide ourselves from the public eye for a while. We make excuses. Sometimes those things don't work. And so sometimes we try to hide from the shame by hiding amongst those or blending in with those who find no shame in what we've done. We try to hide from our shame in many ways. We try to cover our own shame. But that covering isn't enough. We have to seek for the covering that God provides. That's what was big at the beginning. They saw their nakedness. I think it kind of interesting as we look at the end time church, the church of Laodicea, the church of the people judged. The Bible says this about them. In Revelation 3, 17 and 18, it says, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel to thee be, buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. You know what's interesting about this to me, and I hope it is to you, is that in the very beginning, as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, they recognized that they were naked. At the end of time, as God's people are approaching the second coming of Christ, we find that they don't recognize that they're naked, but they are. And God tries to help them understand that they are. And yet in both times, whether they recognized they were naked or whether they didn't recognize they were naked, in both cases, it is God who is the provider of the covering. In Revelation, God provides the covering as Jesus invites them to buy of me gold tried in the fire and, and buy of me white raiment that thou mightest cover the shame of your nakedness. In the original sin, as we look at that first time in, in Genesis chapter 3, as God was covering them there in Genesis 3.21, it said, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord make coats of skins and clothe them. They were naked. They tried to cover themselves with their own, the fig leaves and their own little works, and, and yet that wasn't enough because their, their nakedness and their shame needed to be covered. And God made coats of skins and clothed them. And when God did that, he was instituting the, this plan of the sacrificial system. Because you see, the Bible tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. The Bible clearly indicates that when, when Jesus was going to come to this earth, he was going to have to die. And, and as God had promised just a few verses earlier in chapter 3, that the seed of the woman would come to crush the head of the serpent, the Bible was indicating that the Messiah was going to have to come and die and shed his blood, that humanity might ha have an opportunity to be covered, that you and I might have an opportunity to have our sins covered and our shame covered. And God provided that. Matter of fact, that's what we read as Abraham was taking Isaac up to the mountain, and as Isaac asked his father, Father, I, I see the wood and the fire, but there's no lamb for the offering. And, and Abraham's answer to Isaac in Genesis ch chapter 22, verses 8 says, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. God will provide himself a lamb. I think this is so important. As we go through this, I want you to understand that God is providing the sacrifice. God himself is providing the covering. It's God against whom we are, have sinned. And yet God is the one who's providing the covering 
for us. You see, it's all about the work that Christ is going to do for us and has done for us and will do for us. And so God provides the covering. Genesis 3, verses 22 through 24, after Adam and Eve had sinned, the Bible says he drove out the man and he placed at the east end of the garden cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way to the tree of life. After Adam and Eve had sinned, they were, they were removed from the presence of God. And just like Satan was cast out of heaven for rebelling against God, so humanity was driven out of the presence of God in Eden. We had joined the rebellion. We were part of that rebellion now. We had chosen a new master. And now God, is, it, now God has a question. Now the, the universe has a question. Because God has already said there will be a covering. But the, quest, the universe has a question. How can God justify allowing fallen, rebellious humanity back into the fellowship of heaven. How can God justly do that? And you have to remember that there is a universe of witnesses that are watching. As Lucifer rebelled in heaven, there were all of the heavenly angels and the unfallen heavenly beings that were watching and seeing and hearing the lies and the discussion that was going on that, and how Lucifer had deceived a third of the angels and they, they were cast out of heaven with him. And yet all of the angels that were still in heaven, were, were, they still had those words ringing in their ears. We, there needed to be some justification, this controversy that's going on. And so they're looking and saying, okay, there's a rebellious race here. How can God justify bringing them back into the harmonious economy of heaven? So how does God do that? Revelation 15, verse 3 Speaking of the disjustness of God, it says, They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of the saints. God is a just God. We know that God is love. The Bible tells us God is love. God is also just. God is also full of mercy and, and ready to forgive. But He is just. And He's equally just as He is love. So God is just. The Bible says this in 1 John 1, 9, one of those most famous verses. I love this verse. It says, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. God is faithful to forgive. I am promised of that in the Word. And He's faithful to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. But God is equally just to forgive and just to to cleanse me from unrighteousness. How can God be just to forgive? How does it mean to be just to forgive? Am I not a sinner? Do, do I not need to accept that which I deserve? Have I not offended God? Have I not broken the law of heaven? The very character of God, the very law of God, have I not chosen to be a, a part of the rebellion of Lucifer? And yet... God is just to forgive. How does that work? And when we think about this, we find some verses in the Bible that sometimes cause us to, to, to wonder, okay, I don't know how if you can mesh these two verses. Have you ever came across that? Sometimes you're reading the Bible and you come across one verse and you come across another verse and it seems like they don't, there's no way these two can actually both exist at the same time harmoniously. Here's two verses that are similar to that. Psalm 103, verse 10, it says, He, speaking of God, has not dealt with us after our sins, but nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. With that says that God has not given us what we deserve. We've not received the penalty we, re we deserve. He's not dealt with us after our sins. Uh, that's, praise the Lord. That's a wonderful thought. But this is what it says in Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 27. I will do unto them after their way. And according to their deserts will I judge them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Here, God's saying, according to your deserts is what I'm going to give you. Which, by the way, maybe we need to rethink how many desserts are on the table at fellowship lunch, right? <laughs> That's not the dessert it's talking about. But you can maybe, you know, go there if you want. But this is talking about, I'm going to be receiving that which I deserve according to what I've done. And so both of these are 
seemingly at odds. There is a class of people that is not going to be dealt with after their sins or rewarded according to their iniquity. And there is a class of people who are going to receive according to all of that they have done. What's the difference between these two classes of people? The difference, my friend, is in the coverage. The difference is in the covering. And we can see some of this example in the Old Testament as we go back to the Old Testament Exodus story and we see that night of Passover and as God is preparing the children of Israel for the Passover, He lets them know what they need to do to prepare for the coming of the judgment against Egypt. In Exodus chapter 12 verses 1 through 7, the Bible says, Speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb. That's important. Remember, a lamb. Take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him take and his neighbor next to his house take it, according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. So everyone's supposed to have a lamb. What are we supposed to do with this lamb, Lord? Exodus goes on. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. So God here is saying, look, Israel, you all need to take a lamb, and I want you to keep it for fourteen days, and then I want you to kill it. That's God's command. Kill the lamb. Why should we kill the lamb? Well, God tells us. Exodus chapter 12, verse 7 goes on. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two posts and on the upper door of the post, and they shall eat it. And so there God says, look, you're going you're to take a lamb, a living lamb, a young lamb, a lamb without spot or without blemish, and, and you're going to slay that lamb, and you're going to take the blood from that lamb, and you're going to paint it upon the doors of your home. That's what God told them to do. Why did he tell them to do that? Verse 23 of the same chapter says, For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel, on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. God says, When I see the blood of that lamb, which you killed, by the way, when I see that blood on your door, I will pass over, and the destroyer won't come in. This is, a, this is a symbol of Jesus. We know that Jesus was a Passover lamb. He was our Paschal lamb, it tells us in the New Testament. He was the lamb that was come to take away the sins of the world. And so when we look at the symbolism of the lamb and, and what the ministry of Jesus in reconciling us to him, this is what we have. We have this lamb that, that had to die. Jesus had to die. He had to come and die. This is what the prophecy of the sacrificial system is telling us. The lamb had to die. Jesus has to die. The lamb's life had to be pure. It had to be pure and un, you know, unspotted and unblemished. It, it had to be pure. And so Jesus' life had to be pure as well. Jesus came and lived a sinless life. He was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. He fit that description. And then number three, it says, and they had to apply the blood to their house just as we have to apply the blood of Christ by faith to our own life. And if we do so, then the blood of the Lamb covered them, God passed over them, and the blood of the Lamb covers us. Jesus' blood is our coverage. The Bible says the life is in the blood. Christ's righteous life is represented by His blood, but we have to also remember that in the sacrificial system, when the Lamb was brought for a sin offering, the sin of the sinner was transferred to the lamb, which was symbolically transferred to the blood, which was then carried into the sanctuary. And so your sin was transferred to the blood of this innocent victim. So there was something that we transferred to Christ in the process, and then something that Christ transfers to us. Our sins were laid upon him, the Bible says, our iniquities, he may bore them all. And his righteousness is imputed to us by faith. This is the covering that God provides for us. Romans 6 verse 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death. 
You know, it's kind of an interesting thought that you can both receive wages, but you can also pay wages. The wages of sin is death. Oftentimes we think of this and we think, well, when I sin, I'm eventually going to get paid for my sin with death. And that's valid because oftentimes when we sin, we're actually damaging our life and we're, we're you know, causing stress, which will reduce your life, and we're causing illness, which will reduce our life. And ultimately, the sin, the unforgiven sin in our life, if we retain any and we continue in our sin and we die in our sin, we will pay, we will face the judgment, if you will, and the wages of that sin is death, and that will be death eternal. But you can also think of this aspect of sin as when we are slaves of sin, we then are actually paying something. We're accruing something. This is what it says in Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Let's read this and maybe we'll think about it a little deeply after that. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are, to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So you can be a slave or a servant to two things in this verse. You can either be a slave to sin, or you can be a slave to obedience. Obedience, that servitude, leads to righteousness. The slavery to sin leads to death. But I'd ask us a question. If I'm a servant or a slave, am I getting paid or am I paying? What am I receiving when I'm sinning? I'd like you to think of it a little bit like a credit card, a poorly used credit card. I can take my credit card and I can use it forever I want. And oftentimes, if we're very undisciplined people, which sinners are typically undisciplined people, I'll take my credit card and I'm going to swipe it for all the things that I want. I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. I can't pay for it, I can't afford it, but I want, I want, I want, I want. And all the time, that credit card, whenever I use it, I am receiving something. Selfish gratification in the moment. I pass that credit card and whew, I get something. But what's happening on the other side of that credit card? I am accruing a debt. I am accruing a debt on the other side. And the Bible gives us indication that the debt is equated with transgression. If we have our Bibles in Matthew chapter 18, we're looking at this parable that Jesus is talking and he's talking about forgiveness, but I want us to understand what he's saying about this debt and how it's linked with sin and transgression. Jesus says, beginning in verse 23 of Matthew chapter 18, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. I want to stop just for a moment. There is a reckoning. There is a reckoning. There is an accounting. Jesus said, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. And so there's, a, there's an, a reckoning. There is an accounting that's going to take place. What is being accounted? And in verse 25, it says, For as much as he had not to pay all this debt that he owed his master, the Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. Sounds like a credit card company to me. Right? But this is worse. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And this fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not. But he went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry. And they came and told their Lord what was all that was done. Then his Lord, after he had called him, said unto him, Thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Which literally he begged, Please forgive me my debt. I can't pay it. Please. The Lord said, I forgive you. His master forgave his debt. But what happened? He didn't forgive on the other end. And so verse 33 said, The master is talking, yet he says, Shouldst thou not have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? 
And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors until he should pay all that was due unto him. And so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespass. This idea that our trespasses, our sins, our iniquity is accruing a debt that we cannot pay is there in Scripture for us. And as we accrue this debt to our, the master sin, but the Bible says the wages of that sin is death, we need someone to pay off our debt. We need someone to supply that which we have no ability to supply. And God provided that supply through Jesus Christ. The Desire of Ages has this to say on page 753. It says, Upon Christ as our substitute and surety was laid the iniquity of us all. He was counted a transgressor that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. The, guilty, the guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart and the wrath of God against sin. The terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity filled the soul of his son with consternation. Notice this, that Jesus came and he was our substitute. He was our surety and all of our iniquity was laid upon him to redeem us from the condemnation of the law. And that God's wrath was against sin. That's important. Because sin is the transgression of God's law. God's wrath, His righteous judgment, is not against us per se, but the breaking of the law. God's wrath is against sin, which is the breaking of the law. And so we have this contrast where we have to understand God's wrath, His judgment is because of the breaking of the law, this death that we can't, we can't undo. I mean, the things I've done in the past, I, I can't atone for those. I can't make up for them. Oh, I maybe, can, maybe if I stole $200 from somebody, I can go and pay them back fourfold and give them $1,000 or $800 or whatever. But that doesn't, that doesn't do anything for the sin against God that I committed. And so God sent Jesus to redeem us from that and His wrath against the sin was poured out upon his son. Not his anger at sinners, not this, but the judgment for the transgression of the law Jesus bore for us. This is what it says in Review and Herald, July 1st, 1890. It says, Through Christ, restoration as well as reconciliation is provided for man. The gulf that was made by sin has been spanned by the cross of Calvary. A full, complete ransom has been paid by Jesus, by virtue of which the sinner is pardoned, and the justice of the law is maintained. That's important for us to remember. Justice. Remember, the Bible said God is just to forgive. He's just to forgive. And so in this way, God is just because the debt has been paid in full, in overflowing measure, Christ paid for our debt to reconcile us, to bring us back into harmony with heaven. It goes on and it says, All who believe that Christ is the atoning sacrifice may come and receive pardon for their sins. If you believe that Jesus Christ is your atoning sacrifice, that He is the sacrifice that is going to reconcile you to God, that His offering of Himself on the cross was for your sin. And that through his life and his death and his resurrection and your faith in that, you can be forgiven, then eternal life is yours. And reconciliation with God is yours. This is what's been promised to us through Jesus Christ. And when we look at how this all comes together and how God supplied the sacrifice and supplied the ransom and it met the, the satisfaction of justice of the law, we look back at some of the things we looked at yesterday. We see some of those theories of how God atones. And in the satisfaction theory, for one, Christ's death was understood as a death to satisfy the justice of God. <coughs> Humanity owes a debt to God. These things are true. They're, you think the penal substitution theory, remember we saw some problems with that, but some of the things seemed right. Now as we study a little bit more in this aspect of justification, it says, Jesus, that Christ dies to satisfy God's wrath, which is the just judgment against human sin. 
And Jesus is punished, which means he takes what we deserve. He took our deserts. We weren't treated as though we should have been. We didn't, we didn't receive. God did not deal with us as though as we deserved, but Jesus stood in our place. He was our surety. He is our substitute. And so we see these very similar things going on. And also the penal substitution theory says that imputed righteousness was implied, which was the first theory that really talked about righteousness being imputed, placed upon you. The whole idea that Christ says to the, the church at the end of time, come buy of me gold tried in the fire and white raiment that you might be clothed and that they might hide the shame of your nakedness is an illustration of the fact that Christ's righteousness is that which we by faith get to enjoy. It's imputed to us because you can't earn it. You can't do it yourself. But because Christ lived that perfect life, just like that perfect unblemished lamb, and because Christ died and shed his blood, just like that perfect unblemished lamb, and because he rose again, that wonderful righteousness can be imputed to us by faith. And there's balancing of ledgers. Remember, there was an accounting. There's a reckoning. There are books the Bible talks about. But God provides this covering for us. Romans chapter 8, verse 2 through 4 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. We've been set free. We've been ransomed. We've been redeemed from that law of sin equals death. We've been, we've been freed from that. Matter of fact, in Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. What's the curse of the law? Death. We've been redeemed from these things. And sometimes we want to we want to try to boil atonement down and boil the reconciliation and boil the plan of salvation down to just one little moment at the cross. And though the cross was so very important to all of us, without the cross, without Jesus dying on the cross voluntarily, coming from heaven, God supplying the sacrifice himself. Without the cross, we would have no salvation. But the cross was a moment of the time of reconciliation. It was an integral part of the plan of reconciliation, but his life was equally important. And so is his life after the cross, after the resurrection. All so very important. Because you see, the curse of the law states that if I have sin in my life, it's waiting for me there in the court of heaven. Matter of fact, in the book of Daniel, as we look at this judgment seat sitting in Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 10, we see this scene of, of the ancient of days coming and having the judgment begin. And there, beginning in verse 9, it says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And the judgment was set, and the books were opened. Now, I know there are times when people think, well, God doesn't really keep literal track. There's no real books. I don't know, folks. The Bible says there are books opened. There is a record opened in the judgment. What does that record entail? We see some of that indicated in Revelation chapter 20, where it says in verse 12, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. There were books. There were things that were written there. God didn't give us these words just to, you know, for us to pass over them and not believe that our sin is recorded. But also, the imputed righteousness of Christ is recorded on our behalf as well. Therefore, the book of life is open to. So see, we have a choice. Which book we want to be in and which book is read on our account. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 5 and 6 says, For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ or of, and of God. 
Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. The wrath of God, the righteous judgment of God, is going to fall upon the children of disobedience, but not on the children of obedience. So says the Bible. In Revelation chapter 15, verse 1, I saw another sign in heaven and great and marvelous, the seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. The seven last plagues are coming upon the earth. The wrath of God, the righteous judgment of God is going to fall on the world. Who has coverage? Who's going to be covered from the judgment? The wicked have no coverage. The wicked have no coverage, but God is just in forgiving those who have accepted the blood of the Lamb. God is just. As a matter of fact, the angelic host agree that God is just. For just a few verses later in Revelation chapter 16, verse 5, as the plagues begin to fall upon the earth, the angels say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. God is righteous, which means you, you realize you can't be just and unrighteous, and you can't be unjust and righteous. So you either have to be righteous and just or neither. And so God is righteous, therefore he is just because he has judged thus. And that is this idea with penal substitution, with this legal ledger, the balancing of the books, the idea of judgment is the legal thing. That word krino in the Greek, the word judged means to properly to distinguish, decide mentally or judicially. By implication, it means to try, to condemn, to punish, to avenge. Just as God says, vengeance is mine, I shall repay, saith the Lord. This is the wrath of God. It's the judgment. He has judged justly whether they are children of disobedience or whether they are children of the kingdom, covered by the blood of the Lamb. Romans chapter 3, 21 and 25, we looked at this the last time we met, and I told you we were going to look at this a little closer tonight. It says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. We have to take a look close at what the scripture says. Read the Bible. The righteousness of God, in verse 23. The righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ, unto all. That's the imputation of Christ's righteousness to us by faith. Righteousness by faith. It's not my righteousness, it's Christ's righteousness. It's God's righteousness given to me because Jesus died on the cross of Calvary and because I believe by faith. And again, and as it ends, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption. And justified, what does it mean to be justified? It means to render or regard or as just or innocent. God sees me as innocent. Now, we have to be careful because we're talking about being covered. And the Bible says there was, we're covered for the sins of the past. But we're justified. We're seen as innocent. We're, we're regarded as innocent or just in that moment where we are when we ask the Lord to forgive our sins. But that does not mean that God looks at me each and every day saying, well, no matter what you do, you're just. Oh, no matter what you do, you're okay. God does search my heart. He does look in each and every one of us and He sees if there be any wicked way in us in order to waken us up to say, hey, we need to ask the Lord to come and search me and try me, to give me a new heart, to change those things that are wrong in me. But that's another aspect of reconciliation. That goes beyond the justification coverage that God gives us. But the coverage that God gives us to be justified, to be seen as righteous as we stand here today, God gives us that. That's a free gift. Continuing on in Romans, it says, Whom God hath set forth to be 
a propitiation, which is a covering, through faith in his blood and to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. That word propitiation, I know a lot of people really like that word. Propitiation, some people say, well, it's to expiate, which doesn't really help us much, does it? It means to cover. It's like basically a covering. It's the same word is used in the Old Testament to describe the mercy seat. As a matter of fact, you can see that in Hebrews where it describes the mercy seat. It uses the word propitiate, propitiation. It's the same word. What did the mercy seat cover? The Ark of the Covenant. What was in the Ark of the Covenant? The law of God. We are covered by the righteousness of Christ. That's our covering. Because Jesus was a sacrifice. His blood it was that was sprinkled on that mercy seat. His righteous life, his sacrifice for our sins, the payment that he made for us on our account is paid in full. He is our covering. He it is that supplies all of God's mercy to us in the reconciliation process. You know, when we think of how, how many sins need to be covered in my life, there have been a lot, I have to admit. When I think back, well, I don't want to think back. You probably don't either. But what has God done with those sins? As he's covered me, as he's done, what kind of freedom does that give us? Jeremiah chapter 31, 34 says, They shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. He remembers your sin no more because it's been covered by the blood of his son. Your sin is no more. Matter of fact, in, in Psalm 103, verse 12, it says, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgression from us. He's removed us. We're separate. We're free from that sin of the past. We've been covered by the blood of the Lamb. And in Micah 7, verses 18 and 19, it says, who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. God will cast all your sin into the depths of the sea. What God is trying to tell us in these verses in Scripture is that once you believe in Jesus, knowing that God has provided you the coverage you need, that you can be free from that guilt. You can have the shame covered because Jesus bore it on the cross for you. What do you need covered? Maybe you're listening today and you haven't given everything to Jesus. You haven't made that opportunity. You haven't taken the, that, that hold of that free gift that God gives you that he sent his son to die for you. Do you believe that today? Is there something you desire to be covered? God is not in the insurance business because it's not life insurance you need. But God is in the assurance business because it is eternal life assurance that you need. You know what the premium for God's eternal life assurance policy is? The premium was the blood of the Lamb of God. Do you know how you can sign up for that? By faith in Jesus Christ. You sign up for eternal life assurance because you've been covered by the blood of the Lamb. Are you wanting, are you desiring to give your life over to Jesus today? Do you want the covering that God has provided to to free you from your sins of the past. So your shame is covered. I invite you to take a moment today and just ask Jesus into your heart. Believe that when he died for you, he died for you. And accept him into your heart today. Ask God to forgive you of your sins. He is faithful and just to forgive you. And take that moment right now with me in prayer. I invite you to do so. Father in heaven, 
Lord, we want to thank you for the beautiful word. That word of reconciliation. The promise that you are in Christ reconciling the entire world unto yourself. Not through any of our actions or our righteousness, Lord, for we know our righteousness is nothing but filthy rags. But Lord, you loved us so much that you were willing to send your Son as the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. As a promise of assurance that you would provide the covering we need to have our sins forgiven. And Lord, if there's a brother or sister here tonight or this afternoon or whenever they may be watching around the world and they desire to ask you to forgive them of their sins and they desire for their, their sin and shame to be covered by the blood of Jesus, Lord, as we ask you into our lives once again today and that you would forgive us of our sins. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would assure that brother or that sister that their sins are forgiven. They're covered by the blood. They're as far as the east is from the west. They've cast them into the depths of the sea and that you will remember their sin no more. And Lord, we want to thank you for the promise that you will forgive those who confess their sin and repent. And Lord, so today, we give our lives to you. We thank you for the sacrifice that Jesus gave for us, that our sins might be covered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.